Thanks for again for inviting me along. I said to some of the others, when we were listening to the radio this morning, I said it was minus seven at Mount Crawford. I think that was the coldest place in the state last night. But when we drove up here, we were driving all the way through past Mount Crawford and it was lovely sunshine. And it was about oh, 21, 22 degrees in the car, you know, <laughs> turn the heater up. That was quite pleasant. The sunshine, lovely green grass, 22 degrees. I wasn't worrying about the minus seven at all. So that's good. But it is really nice to actually drive up here. It's just such a lovely countryside to drive through, isn't it? You know? I mean, we're fortunate because we live down near Kaipo Forest and we live out in that sort of, the same sort of land. But it is just such a blessing to drive up and you're saying, I'm going to church and you're just seeing the creation around you. It's, you know, we are privileged when we live this far out and we can just sort of go a couple of K and we see all of it. It's great. Um, this morning... I'm going, to, I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to start looking at the book of 1 Peter. I've got a, another opportunity to preach up here in November. So I'm going to start looking at the book of 1 Peter and we're going to look at that. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to open up to 1 Peter, and I'm going to read the first nine verses, but I must warn you, I'm only going to be doing part of verse 1 this morning. So we'll see. I'm not going to try it. Strain gnats and all that sort of stuff, but we'll just look at what that has there. But uh, let's look at the first nine verses because they're very encouraging. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ <clears throat> and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Great words, aren't they? Great words that Peter wrote. <coughs> now, um, those of you who have got children, do you remember the great joy it was trying to choose the names of your kids? I know for Pauline and I, I'm not sure I'd use the word joy. We read that Paul, Peter here is talking about joy inexpressible. For us, well, when we had our firstborn, um, and I'm not going to tell you who our firstborn is yet, but when we had our firstborn, we had to go through the process of choosing names. And for us, we started a few months earlier, but in those days, we didn't know what gender the, the, our, our firstborn was going to be. So we had to go through the process of picking boys' names and girls' names and trying to put it all together. And when we did that, um, there was a little bit of a catch because Pauline's a teacher and I was a teacher too. So when we came to consider names, we would put up a name and the other one might say, yeah, it's okay, but... And the but came about because we had about 27 kids in our class and sometimes a name would come up and you'd think, 
Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I really want that name at the moment. <laughs> and um, is anyone here called Mark? Oh, I'm so glad. Um, one of the names that was put up was Mark, you know, if it was going to be a boy. Um, I'm not, don't know, I'm not telling you what the gender is, but if it was going to be Mark, at that year, in that year, in one class, I had three students called Mark. And each one of them was rather boisterous, and each one was not a very good um, active learner in the classroom situation. So when Pauline suggested Mark, I just sort of said, ah, no. It wasn't even a consideration. It was a definite no. And she said, oh, it's a good name. It's a good name. The book of the Bible named after, you know, the author. But no, I couldn't countenance it at all. But eventually we had to sort of settle on names, still not knowing the gender. Now, I don't know, if, who found girls' names easier to choose than boys' names? We did. I see a lot of nodding heads here. So we, had, we could get some girls' names um, if it was going to be a girl. And if it was a boy, well, we didn't quite have that ease. It was, ah, yes, ah, mm, no, no. Anyway, we really settled on, if it was going to be a boy, a second name. All right? And then we had to sort of think, okay, what are we going to put as a first name? And so we went through this whole process. And then our firstborn was born. And it was a son. <laughs> so it was a boy. And so, we, okay, half the names went out, all the girls' names we could go and said, oh, okay, we've got a second name, now we have to decide on a first name. We could play the odds a little bit there. See, if it was a girl, we were set. But if it was a boy, we've only got a second name. So we went through the process. Now, being really good decision makers, on day four, it was still unnamed. And our family was getting around to the point of saying, what do we call him? <laughs> and so we just went, OK, what we'll do, we'll take the second name and we'll just put it up as the first name. And then we have to think, OK, what's the second name we're going to give? Because just traditionally have a middle name. Not everyone has a middle name, but we did. So we called him David. And that means beloved of God. All right? We thought, that's a good name. What we put as a second name? Now, we ended up settling on the name Rhys, the Welsh spelling R-H-Y-S, and that means a warrior or a champion or someone who's ardent or enthusiastic. We thought, well, that's, that's got a good meaning too. And because we are committed all of our kids uh, to the Lord, we thought someone who's beloved of God, who's enthusiastic, and, and uh, that, that's a good imprimatur to, as a, in naming them to give them a sense of who they are. And... So their son was dedicated to the Lord and later on we had two girls and the girls' names were much easier and they were also dedicated to the Lord too. But <clears throat> we came up with this process, what name do we choose and what meaning do we have in that name? Now that story is quite relevant to the beginning of our book here because um, the naming is such an important thing and when we consider the first part of this Verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We have the name Peter. Now, all of us in church know that that was not his first name. When he was born, he was called Simeon. And that's the Hebrew pronunciation. And that means he who hears um, what the Lord says. So he was Simeon. But we've had it transliterated into the Greek form, Simon. All right? So... He was, grew up as Simon, and so we have uh, that situation where he's growing up as a Jew, and when he meets Jesus, Jesus says, follow me. And as he does, he follows Christ, and Christ goes on and he renames him Peter. And he says that you will be a rock. But if you read carefully through the word, Peter's not the first name that you hear, hear him being called. From Simon, God calls, uh, Jesus calls him Kepha, which is the Aramaic word, which then gets translated, we call it, as Cephas. Right? You've probably read the Cephas. And then 
the Cephas is transliterated across to the Roman or Latin form, which is Peter and Cephas, or Kepha, Cephas and Peter all mean the rock. Right? So Jesus gives him a new name and he sees in Peter, in Simon, and sometimes we have the dual name, don't we? Simon Peter in the scriptures. He is going to be a person who will become a rock, someone who is stable. And Jesus foresees that this is the character that Peter will have in the disciples, amongst the disciples. He will be the rock there. And so um, Peter himself, if he think, we think back to when he was still Simon being a true Jew, he never would have had anything to do with Samaritans. He never would have had anything to do with the uh, Romans. A Jew isolated themselves away from that. And getting this name Cephas or Peter is showing that there's going to be a bit of a change in the nature and the character of the person. Um, in fact, when we read in Acts 10, the uh, conversion of Cornelius and his family, it's import important to look at what happens to this person, Simon, who is then called Peter. And so when Cornelius, who we are told was a God-fearing centurion, so he's a Roman, but he's a God-fearing centurion, God-fearing Roman, and he has a vision and he is told to call for Simon, who is also called Peter, and he's told to go down to Joppa. So he sends down a couple of his um, uh, servants, two of his servants and one of his soldiers, to go down and collect Peter and invite him back to his place and to get Peter, Peter to speak to them about what's going on. And so you have this now Simon Peter sitting in Joppa and he goes up onto the rooftop and just before these two servants and the, and the soldier arrive, Peter has a vision. All Cornelius knows is send for him and Peter has this vision and we read, uh, he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Again a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So when Peter ended up going and arriving at Cornelius' house, he put in a disclaimer. I think it's really funny how scripture gives us all these little personal aspects. So here's Peter, um, Simon, I'll call him Simon Peter in a way because I want to keep that little bit of Jewishness to him at the moment. And he puts in this disclaimer. He says to Cornelius, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy and unclean. That is why I came without even an objection when I was sent for. Can you see how Peter has changed from this real Jewishness that he wouldn't be anywhere? He wouldn't talk to Samaritans and he wouldn't talk to Romans. It wasn't until Jesus took him as one of the disciples through Samaria, and you have, we have that whole incident, the woman of the well, the Samaritan woman, we, he, um, Jesus had conversations with Romans. It wasn't until uh, Peter had been taken by Jesus that he had moved from his Jewishness that I wouldn't go anywhere like that to seeing that there's a bigger picture that God has in store. And so Peter still, though, has this Jewish roots in him, and he has to say to Cornelius, I didn't bat an eyelid about coming, but you know yourself that it's sort of not right to come. But God has caused me to override that. 
there's a, been a big change from his Jew Simon to now Simon Peter, who is the apostle. So, Peter then goes on to share the gospel with the people in Cornelius' house. And lo and behold, what happens? I mean, a lot of you know the story, I know. Suddenly the Holy Spirit falls upon the people and they are brought to Christ. Because don't forget, this is af way after. This is getting quite um, in the beginning of the apostles' ministry, but Jesus has already ascended. And you have the Holy Spirit falling. And what's unusual about that? The Holy Spirit had fallen on the Jews at Pentecost, hadn't he? But he, this, now he's falling upon the Gentiles. And Peter suddenly has to let the cogs go and sort of say, not only can I go into a Roman place, what God has made clean is clean. What was unholy is now holy. There is no distinction here. And Peter needs to acknowledge God is very much at work in amongst the Gentiles. It is the ministry is now moving. So the Gentiles are brought into the kingdom of God at that time through Peter's preaching. And for him, it would have been one of those watershed moments in his life where suddenly he knew that his own ministry was much bigger than just to the Jewish community. Right? It is now having to move out much further. So we read in those opening words there, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. And really that salutation is quite amazing because we see how much. He addresses himself not as Simon and not as Simon Peter. He just goes straight into Peter. He is writing now to uh, these people in these outlying areas, what is now modern day Turkey, and he's writing to them and he starts off Peter. He's saying, I'm writing to this Gentile, mainly Gentile community. And that's a dramatic change for him and an indication of really how far he has come in his ministry. Um, for many of his listeners, whether they were Jew or Gentile in those scattered uh, locations, were in fact the product of, of some of his own ministry out there. So he had been ministering out there and now he's writing to them uh, in those areas. And he's really identifying himself uh, with the people that he's writing to. And you can see that the God, the Trojan God, God the Father, Son and Spirit, has really changed the cultural norms that dictated much of Peter's earlier life. Uh, now he was aware God was really painting on a much broader canvas than he had imagined. So Simon learned this as he travelled with Jesus, as he travelled, uh, as the Holy Spirit revealed to him uh, how wide the gospel was to reach and that God always has his plans for mankind. There's no thing that God, nothing, uh, that wasn't going to do. Even the Old Testament refers to that Gentile outreach, but the Jews traditionally had had that closed off in their mindset and now they see it working out. Now, for us though, what can we get from this? I think it's good for us to ask ourselves, do we have any exclusion zones in our own mind about where we share the gospel? You know, do we sort of limit it uh, to f some family members who know how we are, but the other family members, the extended family, we're a little bit more silent on? Or do we share our faith with them too? Um, are you comfortable sharing it with the acquaintances you meet. Do they know that you're a person of faith? Are you comfortable going out? I think Simon Peter wasn't comfortable initially going to the Jews, but God had to teach him and show him and change him. Are we willing to share our faith outside of just the intimate uh, people we know? What about work colleagues um, or casual contacts? Are we able to uh, be free to do that? Now, I'll share I, one of my sisters-in-law, I've got a, few, a couple, but one of my sisters-in-law, uh, she is someone who is so in love with the Lord, she just can't help but share with people. Um, not in an offensive way. She is a very caring person, very um, aware person, 
but she just walks up to people and she just talks as if this is the norm of life and so she will share about things of God and she said some things to uh, some people that we've gone I'm not sure I'd be able to say that but she is so genuine and so loving that even when she talks to non-Christians they see that it's coming from her heart not from an intellectual I've got to share the gospel and they forgive her lots of things because she just lets it flow naturally not carefully or casually some of the things that I've thought oh what you've said is really good I'm not sure I might be able to say that you know in that way but it just flows from her because her love of the Lord is so great it is so part of her she just shares it as she goes and it's really beautiful to see her just talk to people uh, in the, that don't have any Christian background at all um, it's a great freedom to live in that way isn't it if you're able to just do that it's a great freedom now the passage here goes on to tell us that Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ and that phrase has a twofold meaning to be an apostle meant that Peter had been personally selected by Christ to be a, an apostle but the word apostle also means that's the messenger who is also sent with the message. So it's not only being selected by Jesus, but it is always also to, to tell the message. And that's the term an apostle. Now Paul's apostleship was called into question by some, but Peter's was never disputed. They knew he was an apostle that had been with Christ from the beginning. And that office of apostleship may not have been a significantly high position um, in the culture uh, but it was still an important and was still a significant one. Uh, the title that the 12 were given as apostles gave them an authority. They had been with Jesus. Um, they could encourage people, they could teach them, they could rebuke them, they could guide them. They had the authority that came because people knew that they had been with Christ. It wasn't somewhere down the line, down the school. And that gave them an authority also to criticise so-called self-professed teachers. They weren't there to put out their own brand of teaching. This is what Christ has said. We are witnesses of this. They had travelled him for years and years. They had been on the good sides and the bad side of uh, having to learn that. They had been through the trials and tribulations and when they spoke of the things of Christ they were speaking of fir first hand information. That's what they knew. But the other thing about the apostle was that they were witnesses of the resurrection. That's the key thing. That's why they were apostles. And so um, they could testify clearly of all the events that they were talking about and what Christ had referred to. They also knew the Old Testament prophecies and could fill in this Old Testament prophecy, this is how it refers to Christ. And they were able to, because Christ would have shown them through his own teaching where he is referred to in the Old Testament, as we call it, which would have only been their scriptures in those days, and how he is the fulfilment of it. So they had this authority. So when we read Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, we're talking about someone who's writing to the Gentiles, a largely Gentile population, but he's also saying, this is the authority by which I am at going to speak to you. And so as we go through all the book of 1 Peter, he has some tough things to say, and he has some also very good things to say, and the authority in which he can say that is because he has been with Christ. Does that make sense? So he's establishing not only his identification with the Gentiles, he's also identifying the, oh, expressing the authority by which he is able to say these things to them. So through the whole book, uh, this salutation is a really strong, positive thing. Now, um, uh, the um, <coughs> just an aside though, uh, later on we sort of think, if the apostles we know most of them had fairly tough lives of ministry. But the good thing is that even though they went through a lot of the trials and tribulations, that also the, um, 
that Jesus foretold would happen to them. In um, uh, Luke chapter 22, we do see what's the end result of these apostles. And Jesus says that when they come into the kingdom, they will sit on thrones and ju judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're not just put out to the side and they go through martyrdom and all these difficulties, but they are going to be people who have positions of authority still in the coming kingdom, even though it wasn't necessarily seen that easily while they were alive. Now, Peter then addresses his uh, audience. He says, to those who reside as aliens and scattered through all these places which we now call modern-day Turkey. Um, now, this term, exiles, um, is uh, for those who lived outside of Israel. Now, when uh, Israel was carted off in the Babylonian exile, uh, a lot of the people were just waiting because they had heard that Jeremiah the prophet had pro prophesied that God's discipline of sending them off to Babylon uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, that was going to last for 70 years. And then God would return them back to Israel. So they were exiles in Babylon, weren't they? But not everyone who went to Babylon came back. Some stayed over there, some had formed businesses, some had got families and all of that was still there. So they didn't all come back. And this term, exiles, were those who lived outside of Israel. Now centuries later, not just the product of those, but other people left Israel and established themselves in all of these centres and towns and villages up, uh, to the north. And they had set up themselves as Jewish communities in those towns and some of them had become Christians. The gospel had gone out and they'd done that. But not only had some of those Jews become Christians, a lot of the Gentiles had become Christians too. So Peter, when he talks about these places, uh, uh, Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia, now Asia's not talking about these, you know, China and all that, it's talking um, up uh, just on the western side of modern day Turkey and Bithynia, they were places where the, you had had the gospel preached. And in, uh, when Peter's writing this, which is about 64 AD, there were more Gentile Christians in that whole area than there were Jewish Christians. So when he's writing here, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's writing to a mainly Gentile with some Jewish Christians in that area. That makes sense? So that's why he wants to keep the name Peter to identify with that uh, Gentile thing and the name, uh, his authority by which he's about to teach. And so... He, um, he says to them, you are exiles. What does he mean by that? Well, they would have understood that exile was that they were really, as Christians, exiles in this world. The term is really talking about your real home is not where you're living. Your real home is going to be in heaven. That, so they are exiles in this life wherever they're living, whether they're in Israel, whether they're up there in the north, their home ultimately is in heaven. And so you have Peter here in here, this salutation, in this introduction, saying, um, I'm writing to you and have this authority that's given to me by Christ, but what's your situation? You really are exiles in this world. You really are aliens in this world because the world is not your ultimate dwelling place. Your ultimate dwelling place is in heaven. Now, why would he write that? Well, if you know one Peter, you go on and read that these people are really struggling. They're really uh, having trials and tribulations and problems. And Peter wants at the outset to encourage them to say, don't look at your temporal situation now, which may be really difficult, but look forward to the hope that you have later on in heaven and that's going to be your home. This temporary thing might be 60, 80, 100 years, whatever, but for eternity, that's going to be your home. That's going to be in heaven. And so um, that reminds us also of what uh, Paul says where he writes 
in uh, Philippians 3. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a saviour, Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, of Christ's glory. That's what's going to happen. So that's also uh, reinforced for us by the writers to the Hebrew, uh, who writes of those in Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter, isn't it? That's the one where we talk about all of the old people of faith who died, and the writer writes, for all these died in faith, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for to those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. All of those people in the Old Testament who died in faith, they never saw Christ, but they had the hope that they were going to be in heaven with God. So it's really um, an important for us to consider too, if we look at how might this apply to our current life situations. Do we see our current situation here on earth as our permanent home? Or do we see it transitory? Do we see that ultimately we are going to be in heaven and we have the good, the bad and the ugly all coming through our life now, but ultimately our home is going to be one of glory and perfection and peace and grace and mercy, isn't it? That's what we look forward to. Um, now, when we go caravanning, um, we do like to visit lots of places. We like to see what they look like. But those, who have, those of you who have travelled for any extended time, what's the one thing you like near, as you get towards the end of the trip? is to get home, isn't it? It's, it's universal, you know, people who go on the road for two years, they often still keep a home or a unit or a flat, you know, if they're going to travel. They need a place to call home. And when, so when we go caravan, we love all the things we see, we choose places that really are nice to go and look at, but there's that point at which we do want to come home and we want to put our feet up, we want to relax as much as you can with property you have to do things around, but, you know, you relax when you come home, don't you? And in the same way, I think, we on this earth, we are waiting and enjoying what we're seeing, but we also want to get to heaven where we'll have that eternity with God. It's just a good way to be. Um, so, to sort of try and tidy this up, we've all been given a name, haven't we? Just like we had to call our kids' names, you've all got a name. Now, the disciples... They all had names, but we do know that some of them had two names, but they weren't given a new name. Now, Matthew was also called Levi, right? Thaddeus was also called Judas. Now, why do you think we read the name Judas, uh, Thaddeus so often? It's because we don't want, he didn't want to confuse his name being Judas with Judas Iscariot, right? So you have uh, different people um, called by different names. Matthew, do you remember his other name? No, Matthew was uh, Didymus. Right? Do you know what Didymus means? Twin. So Matthew, maybe he was a twin. I don't know, but he was called Didymus. And so they had second names, but that's what they always had from the beginning. Peter, on the other hand, was called Simon. Or Simeon or Simon. And he was given a new name that was nothing like it was, from he who hears to he who's going to be the rock, right? So um, there's this uh, name change and Jesus' statement to him in the, uh, along the way was that when he was talking about building his church, now the rock here in, in uh, the verse I'm going to quote can refer to either Peter or it can be to Jesus who's the rock upon which the church is built. I'm not going to get into the theology of that at the moment, but that's another d debate. But this is what Jesus said to Simon. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That means son of Jonah. Right? Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. That is that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. But my father who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, 
and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <coughs> Peter's going to be involved in the building of the church, isn't he? Whether it's on him or whether it's on Christ, we know it's on Christ, but that. But this name, Rock, was given to him and it's recorded for us in both Aramaic and in the Roman and Latin, for, Latin form. Cephas or Kepha or Peter. And so while Peter was Jewish by birth and disposition, he was to be apostle to both the Jews and the Gentiles, of which we are the grateful recipients of that, aren't we? And this letter bears testimony to that. So let us not forget what Peter is introducing to his readers. They are to consider themselves not only as geographic aliens or exiles, but they are to see themselves as sojourners in this life, as their true home will be in heaven. And it's a good lesson for us to learn too. It's a very good lesson. Uh, the time will come for all those who trust and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, through his atoning death on the cross for their sin, that they too will be citizens in heaven. That's the hope. Whenever we share the gospel to someone, this is the hope. Their sins are forgiven and their eternal hope will be a life in heaven with their saviour. That's the promise of God, isn't it? And to those who he has called, to those who have believed, and those who obey his commands. So... There's a glorious future that waits all those who believe in Christ. So my encouragement would be to you, don't be afraid to share your faith because from that, for those who do accept it, they get eternity outside of the battles of this life but eternity in heaven too. Eternity is a long time compared to the time we actually spend on earth, isn't it? So I'd encourage you with those words. Amen. Let's just pray before we continue. Father, we thank you that you do raise up your people. You give them gifts and abilities and opportunities to share your gospel with others. We would pray for ourselves now that we may not be uh, reluctant or reticent or shy or bashful but we may be people who are so in love with you who are so enamoured with your word and the promises that you make that we may be people who as Peter has an authority from you we have an authority from you through your spirit who is with us at times of conversations that we may share the good news of the gospel that others may come into your kingdom and as you call them and justify them, that you will um, let them also know the joy they have ahead of them to be able to spend eternity in heaven with you. Amen. <coughs> Jeff. <coughs>